security. A container for our study. Yep. A container for our study together in a bracha. So join me please. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidshanu Bamitzvota Vitsivanu La Asok Bidivre Torah. Um glad to be with you all. Uh, I want to I, last week I, I wanted to dedicate our class in memory of the the victims of the most recent Texas shooting. And I'm not going to continue to do that each week, but I read something at the end of the last week that has really stayed with me, which is that um, according to someone's calculation, it takes us just <coughs> four days to forget uh, to forget a piece of news like that, for it to fall out of our, our, um, our primary radar screen and I'm just looking for ways to keep this on our radar screen. So if our study could somehow lead to um, healing in the world, improvements in the world, then it's worth taking a moment to say so. Okay, so with that, I would like to study with you today from Parashat Naso, the second parasha of the book of numbers and i want to just say a couple of things about um about this parasha and what i'd like to do today so this is the parasha that gives us the most famous and beautiful and really central birkat kohanim the three-line blessing that the priests according to the torah said in the mishkan and that was then uh, carried on through the the temple and then into our Sidur. So it's it's the way we end the Amidah. And of course, we also use it for many families for blessing their children on Friday nights. And many times we hear it under a chuppah at the end of a wedding cer uh, ceremony. So really important piece of liturgy, and I think the oldest one that we have that's still in continuous use. I think that's right. <clears throat> so I'd like to look at it with you today um, with an eye towards some of the history that's attached to it in Jewish tradition. And uh, why not also just mention the way that the priestly blessing is one of the expressions of temple history that the rabbis held on to after the temple was destroyed. And we'll see that in our, in our study. There are many different ways that the Talmud keeps referring back to the temple. And I was thinking about this. It's almost like the way that some of the prophets, I guess, Isaiah and Ezekiel in particular, uh, no, and also Zechariah, Mapitom, you know, there are several of the prophets speak about the reconstruction of the temple you know, speak about how we're going to go back and rebuild and this is what it's going to look like. And it's a similar thing, I think, that goes on in the Talmud among the rabbis, especially the first generations of rabbis who, again, as we understand it, still believed they were going back. So there's a lot of material in the Talmud in general that is about, well, how did they set up the sacrifices and how did they set up the Mizbeach, the altar, etc. And so there's some of that baked into today's learning as well. And uh, um, it's a source of, of ongoing interest for us, not because we're, we're not standing in the same posture that they were. We're not hoping to rebuild the temple. Uh, you know, I would say lehefech, like the opposite of that, um, that we're not trying to, to resurrect all those practices. And yet at the same time, if we have some sense of lineage, which I think we do, that is baked into the marrow of our spiritual understanding, this relationship with God through temple practices and, and then therefore through this remnant that we have of temple practice in the Birkat Kohanim. Um, okay, I have other things I wanna say, but let's go to our, our materials. Hang on, let me just pull it up. Okay, can everyone see that? 
So I've titled this week, wait a minute, can I get this to go? Hold on. There, okay. I've titled this, Can You Keep a Secret? And you'll see why as we unpack our, our text. Okay, so here we are at the, almost at the end of the parasha, which is where the Birkat Kohanim comes in. I think this will be familiar to you, but let's just walk ourselves through it. We're at the end of, towards the end of Numbers chapter 6. Daber el Aharon ve'el banav. So God's commanding that um, Moses speak to Aaron and to his sons who have already been designated as that first, uh, you know, founding, founding priesthood. Daber el Aharon ve'el banav lemor. Speak to them and say, Ko tevarchu et b'nei Yisrael. This is how you will bless the children of Israel. Amor lahem, say to them, and here are the three lines of the priestly blessing. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. May God bless you and keep you. Second line, Ya'er Adonai panave lecha v'chunecha. May God make God's face to shine on you and be gracious to you. I always look forward to this one little word, vichuneka. <laughs> it's it's the root. It gives us comes from the root uh, chen, which is grace, graciousness. Uh, it's also where we get the name chana, chanan, uh, etc. It's a beautiful word. Um, I think that just to dwell on this for a moment, I don't think in this case it means grace in the same way that uh, I believe it's understood in in Christian communities. Um, I think it's it's a little bit different for us that we're in a relationship of loving kindness with God. We look for that relationship, even in times of suffering for ourselves or in the world. So we're looking for that grace to to uh, be present in our relationship with with God. And the last verse, Yisa Adonai Panave Lecha, may God's face be lifted to you. Ve'asem Lecha Shalom and bring you peace. Okay, so there's the, the original text. And um, you can think of all the times that we've, we've, we've said it many, many times together in synagogue and other places and times that you've heard it. Okay, so now I want to just point us to a totally different part of the Torah, which is going to be important in the next text we're going to look at. Okay, so this is just to get us ready. Now we're in back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. So this is the beginning, still the beginning of Exodus. And this, um, if I'm remembering correctly, this is the moment where basically Moses is saying to God, you know, if I'm going to do this thing that you want me to do, if I'm going to go forth to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, if I'm going to call the children of Israel forward into out of slavery, who shall I say is calling? Like, who, who are you? What's your name? Um, and God says, sorry, my dog suddenly is presenting himself for attention. Ko tomar al b'nei Yisrael, Adonai Elohei avotechem. This is what you should say to the children of Israel. yud he vav he, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, shlachane alechem, has sent me to you. This is Moses speaking. And then God saying, Ze shmi le'olam. So just pay attention to that. Ze shmi le'olam. Veze zichri le'dor dor. This is my name for all eternity. And this is my, this is how you can remember me. This is how you'll know me from one generation to the next. Okay, so just tuck that away. Now I'd like to look with you at a, a little, uh, portion from the Talmud, from the Gemara. This is from Tractate Kiddushin 71. And I feel like I should just pause for a minute and explain a little bit about why I'm bringing this out. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, there are all these places in the Talmud that are discussions about the temple, discussions of what went on in the temple. And that's what we're going to see here. And again, it's it seems we read it now, it looks like uh, generations of sages who are trying to figure out, 
Are we supposed to be going back? Are we supposed to remember all these uh, practices and details because we're going back? Or I would imagine later on, after they maybe realized that they weren't going back, at least not immediately, it was sort of how do we remember this as we go forward? How do we hold on to this legacy as we transition forward? And in this passage from Tractate Kiddushin, we're going to see a little bit of a discussion about the name of God and who's allowed to say the name of God and actually what is the name of God um, in, and as, as it relates to the Birkat Kohanim. Okay, so the part that I deleted out because it's a super long uh, section, I took out a whole bunch. There's a long discussion about who is who qualifies to say the name of God and it goes into some um, some exploration of, in fact, Jewish identity, who's allowed to participate in this. I took all of that out. That's for another time. We're now going to just come to what is the true name of God and how does it get revealed? Okay, so let me go back to that. Okay, so keep remember to hold on to our Exodus 315 verse because these these sages are going to use it to make their point. All right, and so just um, reminding us that on the left, the English side, the bolded part is the actual text of the Gemara and the unbolded part is the editor filling in for us what we wouldn't be able to understand uh, if we didn't have that fill in. And on the right is just the text of the, of the Gemara. So we'll start here. I'm going to start over here in the English. Rabbah Bar Barchana says that Rabbi Yochanan, they always say in the name of my teacher, the sages transmit the correct, correct pronunciation of the four letter name of God to their students once every seven years. Some say it's once every seven years and some say twice every seven years. So let's just pause and absorb that little suggestion. Oh, the, the four letter name of God is only pronounced in its fullness once every seven years or maybe twice in a seven year cycle um, can't help but mention it's interesting that it seems to line up with the Shemitah cycle of things I don't know whether there's any connection there or not but wow so that tells you right there that there was some practice about not saying God's name out loud not saying it in its uh, original form most of the time here you can see it says so now we're coming to another opinion. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, well, it's probably once every seven years, not twice every seven years. Twice every seven years would be too much, he says. Why? And here he's going to use the verse from Exodus 3 uh, that we looked at above. Uh, I wanted to come to it here. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, he explains, Kamanda Amar, Pam Echad Bashavua, once a week, uh, once a week, Dichtiv Ze Shmi Leolam. Okay, Ze Shmi Leolam, can you all see that? Uh, I thought it would let me, there. No, here. Zeshmi leolam, and if you look at this word leolam, ze this shmi is my name leolam for all eternity. Except they're going to say you can change the vowels around here, which you're allowed to do in Hebrew, and instead of leolam you get lealem. So instead of leolam eternity, you get lealem to hide or to conceal. And you can see here in the English, uh, once every seven, so he's saying it must be that they only allowed the name to be recited once every seven years because here it says in Exodus, so it must be true, this is my name forever, which is written so that it can be read le'alem, not le'olam, but le'alem, to hide. This indicates that the divine name must remain hidden. You're not supposed to say God's name out loud. You're not supposed to share it. Okay, I'm going to skip down a little bit. 
So they continue to play with this verse, this Exodus 3, verse 15. And then we're going to come to at least one uh, explanation about how we go from yod heh vav -Hey to the way we normally say God's name in, even to, to today. The explanation, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, not as I am written am I pronounced. I am written with the letters yod heh vav -Hey, while my name is pronounced with the letters Aleph, Dalid, Nun, Yud. Right? My name is pronounced Adonai, not however you pronounce these four letters. Okay, let's keep going. The sages taught, initially, the, uh, the leadership would transmit the, now we're saying there was a 12 letter name of God to anyone. They would use it freely. But then they noticed that it was being put in the mouths of people who didn't behave according to the standards that they uh, preferred or required when the uninhibited ones who used the name disrespectfully increased, they would transmit it only to discrete members of the priesthood and the discrete members of the priesthood would pronounce the name during the priestly benediction. Okay, so now somehow we've jumped from a four letter name of God, just want you to see this um, Sorry, it's up here. Barishona Shem Bene Shtemisre Otiot. Initially, or at the beginning, the name with 12 letters, Hayu Mosrinoto Lechol Adam, they would say it to anybody. Anybody could walk in and hear the 12 letter name of God. Hayu Mosrinoto Litsnuim. So only when they started to realize, you know what? Some people are, are having access to this 12 letter name and they don't behave well. They are the ones doing things in their daily activities that we don't agree with. And so we're not gonna just allow it. We'll only allow those who behave with proper modesty. Litsnua, shabakuhuna, vahatsnuim shabakuhuna, the more modest leaders Mavli'imoto b'ni'imat achehem ha'kohanim. Mavli'imoto. So this is interesting. Mavli'im can be translated as they pronounced it, they, they spoke it, but it can also mean they swallowed it. Like they put it in their mouths in kind of a muffled... So you, they said it, but not loud enough really for anybody to hear it. So they transmitted it to their, their brothers, it says, but they're, meaning their colleagues, their, the priesthoods, because they wanted the other priests to know the name of God, but to protect it, to keep it essentially a secret. Okay, we keep going now. Tanya Amar, Rabbi Tarfon. So now Rabbi Tarfon is speaking to us. Pamachad aliti achar achi imi. One time I went up to um, my mother's, uh, my brother, my mother's brother, excuse me, le duchan. So the duchan is where we get the, in Yiddish, duchanen or duchening, we say in English, which we'll say more about in a minute. But in this case, the duchan is the, the, the bima. It's the place where the priests would stand when they were carrying out their duties. Vihiteti ozni, I sort of tilted my ear, etzel kohen gadol, towards the kohen gadol. So I just imagine this scene, this, this young, let's say, you know, kohen trainee is, I went up and I listened to the kohen gadol. Vishamati shehivlia, same word as mavliim. She, she, so it could be read as like he pronounced the name of God or he somehow swallowed the name of God. Shamati shehivlia shem, the name of God. Bene'imat echav hakohanim. He uh, gave it over with this particular melody or this particular way of chanting it to the other priests. Okay, and then I want to switch back over here. 
you can see the English of what we just we went through. Now, Rav, Rav Yehuda says in the name of Rav, oh, not four letters, not 12 letters, but 42 letters. The 42 letter name of God may be transmitted only to one who is discreet and humble and stands at, at least half of his life, in other words, behaves well, and does not get angry and does not get drunk and does not um, insist upon his rights, but is willing to yield. So laying out some behavioral requirements for one who is going to get to the inner sanctum of the true name of God, the secret hidden name, which has 42 letters. And I'm just reading this and I'm, I can't help but think of Rabbi Fred counting the Omer last Friday night when it was the 42nd night. And I, I don't know how many of you were there, but he he took us on a little journey about the number 42 and its mystical meaning, um, it, not only in Jewish tradition, but in other places. So that's interesting too, that in, we have this connection to God through 42 letters, but it's most secret. In fact, so secret that none of us has any idea what it would have been today. We, it's lost. It died with the priesthood. Anyone who knows this name and is careful with it and guards it in purity is beloved above and treasured below. In other words, the person who can um, rise to this level of behavioral exactitude and spiritual purity is beloved by God and also treasured among people and fear of him is cast upon the creatures and he inherits two worlds, this world and the world to come. He has ensured a place in the world to come. Okay, so just pause with me for a minute and take in the imagery here. We're in the temple and we're hearing that there were maybe several different ways of um, fulfilling the commandment to bless the people, as the Exodus passage said. Um, this is how you should bless. You have to say the priestly blessing, excuse me, the numbers passage. Uh, and at the same time, how do you make sure that you don't take the name of God in vain or somehow um, soil it or um, spoil it by allowing access to it from people who shouldn't be hearing it in its pure form? Okay, so hold on to that image now. Now we're going to zoom ahead to probably the 12th century. I'm not sure exactly when Rashi wrote this, 11th, 12th century to Rashi. And let me go back now. Okay, so Rashi is now commenting on this Gemara that we just read. Okay, so this is short. It was not translated and I didn't try to write a translation, but I'll walk us through it. So that was, that's Rashi's commenting on this passage from the Gemara. Remember, that's that word that's somehow they pronounced it, but also they kind of swallowed it. Like they weren't really ready to just let it out to anyone who wanted it. They, um, they transmitted it in this, I think if I do this, yeah, it'll let me, ne'imat. So ne'ima is, is at its root, it has this, uh, like from the same uh, ne'omi, noam, ne'ima is like pleasant or sweet, but it's also used to describe a melody or a, a melodic passage. So this is how the priest would transmit the name of God in some kind of melodic passage. Now Rashi's commenting. Otan shelo hayu bukiin bo umvarchin b'shem ben arba otiot kshehayu moshchin et kolam b'neima. They would they would uh, new pour forth the name of God in this melody. Just stick with me here, where I want you to see the end of this. Elu. Um, Mimaherim lehavlia, same verb again, mavliim, to speak or maybe to swallow. Here again, lehavlia et shem ben yud bet, 12 letters, velohaya nishma rabim, so that most could not hear it. 
מכל נעימות חבריהם בנעימת ביסום כל שקורין. And then look what he does here. What word is that? Anybody recognize that? That I just highlighted? Trope. Oh, trope. It's trope. Oh, It's wow. the first time that we see the word trope used in Jewish tradition. Rashi reaches into Latin and takes it and puts it in his commentary. And in this case, we think he means, uh, so we, we understand trope to mean the, the musical symbols that we use in chanting the Torah or the other biblical text. It, it gives us a way to chant them. That's also a, a form of punctuation when we chant. In this case, Rashi's using the word trope to describe his understanding of the sage's understanding from, you know, six, seven hundred years before of the biblical priesthood practice of chanting the name of God with another melody overlaying it so that it couldn't be heard properly, so that it couldn't be heard. So in other words, the priest could, on the one hand, fulfill the commandment of, of blessing the people and at the same time protect what they believed was this secret, um, most authentic name of God. So if you ever wondered when you were sitting in your bar mitzvah lessons, what is this word trope and how did we ever get it? We have Rashi to thank for it. He's the one that brought it to us. Okay, just a little bit of explanation. So this is now a commentary on Rashi or a really just an explanation of Rashi, which just is saying um, something like what I was just explaining here uh, on this word ni'ima, which gets transformed into something like tropa or trope, um, which is also known as in Hebrew, nigun, a melody. And you can see here the etymology which takes us through um, in, in the English and then in, ultimately into French even, strofa, troubadour, trouvere, all different ways of giving over a word with a melody attached to it. And in this case, in the case of the sages, for the sake of concealing it, for the sake of ma making it um, inaudible. So let me pause here for a moment. Go ahead, Audrey. Just a quick question. So is this the origin of the, of having certain melodies associated with enchanting Hebrew? And if not, was there a, like a certain special melody that was used by the priest that would always be used? Like they couldn't make up their own you know, tune. Right. There was no Debbie Friedman. Yeah. No. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, it's a good question. And just to dwell on the word trope for a minute, you know, you all know this. The trope system that we have today was oral for hundreds of generations, probably, for a very, very long time. Only later did they devise, you know, physical symbols, uh, physical visual symbols to go with the tropes to act like notation, which is, of course, very helpful because If you you all know the game of telephone, if you hand something down orally one generation after another, it's very easy for it to get uh, to, to change over time. And if you're trying to hold on to a text in its original form and it's the form you believe that was given by God or at least canonized by the rabbis, etc., you want to have a system for holding on to uh, its proper pronunciation, punctuation, etc. And of course, having said that, the priestly blessing, Birkat Kohanim, is probably one of the texts that's been set to more different kind of musical settings than almost anything else. Well, among, among the top 10, for sure, um, of, of passages in our Tanakh and then in our liturgy. Um, so I have a whole bunch more that I want to do with you, but other just immediate questions or thoughts? Luther, go ahead. I'm struck by the uh, later etymology of the Latin root for trope, which not only is troubadour, which of course makes sense in this whole context, yeah. but in French, trouvere, 
which means to find. Aha. Uh -huh. To there yeah. is to find. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Everybody, this is, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. So just take a deep breath. So Shlomo, and I, Shlomo, I was, I was going to ask you later on, because I want to ask you if you would talk about the, your experience of participating in the ritual of Duchening, which you've talked to me about before, but go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say that my favorite name for God is the 11 letter name given at the burning bush. Eh, yeah, Asher, eh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised that that name doesn't show up somewhere in this discussion. Yeah, it's interesting that you're saying that and it doesn't show up unless they unless they somehow mean that 11 letter name with a hyphen to make the 12. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where they get 12 from. They don't tell you what the 12 letter name is in their in their discussion. So thank you for mentioning that. OK, back or the 42. To, yeah, the 42 is who knows what that might be. Um, and Barb, you're saying. Um, the 11 letter name is right before Exodus 315. The Aye Asher Aye is right before uh -huh. this passage we've been studying. It yes. immediately precedes it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which makes Shlomo's point even more interesting. Yeah, you mean just in terms of Not mentioning it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Six times seven. Okay, but what's the meaning of that? Why is that saying? Okay, you could you could make a whole drash about it for sure. All right, let's go back to Safaria to our page for a minute. All right, so we did all this Rashi. This is now just a modern commentator adding his. He's just um, just saying more about what we've just been through. So let's just read through this. According to this view of history, at one point, everyone knew God's 12 letter name, but people began to use it for their own gain. And at that point, it needed to be hidden. So the priests decided they continued to transmit it to priests who would guard it properly, except they guarded it so carefully that now we don't know what it is anymore. The priest softly uttered it during the chanting of the priestly blessing. And he says here, as we just saw, Rashi explains that most priests would use God's four letter name as we do today. Yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, and as he as he affirms, we don't pronounce Yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, we pronounce Adonai instead, which simply means my Lord. When they would extend their singing, the priests who knew the 12 letter name would utter it so that most people couldn't hear it. Rashi even translates translates chanting into French as trope, as in Torah trope. OK, so just to kind of wrap that up a little more. OK, so on to our time. So let me stop the chair again for a minute. In the Reconstructionist movement, as we know, we have, for the most part, done away with the, the Jewish spiritual caste system. We don't recognize Kohen, Levi, and Yisrael in the Reconstructionist movement, and that was an explicit choice made by the founders of the movement to do away with this social hierarchy that exists. Um, and there's, uh, there's so much to say about that. Um, it's, it's been a source of some pain within the Jewish community. I mean, not the doing away with it, but the, the fact of it. Um, I'll just quickly share a story I heard most recently. Um, this was by way of Ethan Tucker, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, who is uh, one of the leaders of Hadar. He was describing a situation where a Jewish man who had become, he was Jewish, but he had become Baal Tshuva. He had become much more observant, very, very observant and religious, um, was about to get married. And the woman that he was marrying was a, 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 a Jew by choice. She had converted. She had converted under the strictest rabbinic supervision, but she was, and she was a Jew by choice. And he, the groom, um, went to the cemetery to visit his ancestors, as is often done before a wedding. Um, and in going to the cemetery, he learned for the first time that his, I think in this story, his grandfather had been a Kohen. And that, that meant that he also was a Kohen. He apparently learned this. He hadn't known it before, and somehow it hadn't come up in all of his studying and so on. Um, 
And according to the strictest tradition, a Kohen may not marry a Jew by choice. So he went to his rabbi. This is recently, like within the last 10 years, I think. He went to his rabbi to say, I think hoping the rabbi would say, you know, it's fine. Everybody's kosher. Go get married. And in fact, he was told, no, you'll have to call off the wedding. And he did. And I, I just remember hearing that story and just being so uh, struck by it and sort of horrified by it. As in my world, in my understanding of our tradition, we allow ourselves to evolve and we don't hold ourselves to these strict delineations. But in fact, in, in classical rabbinic Orthodox Judaism, they very much still exist. So when I mention sometimes sources of pain, um, when Jonathan and I were in Israel this past winter, we participated, as I've told you all, with this really lovely Masorti community. We also visited a modern Orthodox community in Zichron a few times. There, they were so happy to see Jonathan, who's a Levi, walk in because they knew they had the second Aliyah ready to go. And of course, I had to just sit in the back row, not because I'm a woman, but because I have no claim to any Jewish status. I have to say that my dad is here with us today, which is so lovely. Um, so. Dad, you're as, you're as good as any Kohen in my book. Um, uh, so, so those kinds of divisions and restrictions are still very much in practice today. Um, the Reconstructionist movement, I was starting to say, explicitly did away with them. So we don't, in our, in our shul, anybody can have the first Aliyah, anybody can have the second Aliyah, etc. And as I've mentioned before, maybe just individually in other contexts, I've always felt a little bit of sadness that we put that aside because it's it's to lose an important piece of our history as a people. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about ways we might be able to maintain that history without the, the class um, challenges that come with it. I don't know what the answer is to that yet, but it's just a question that I've had for myself. Okay, so there is this custom of duchenen and the, the word duchenen comes from the Aramaic duchan, which just meant the, as I said before, the, the place where the priest would stand to recite the priestly blessing. Most communities in the diaspora um, participate in duchenen. Duchenen is the Yiddish form, duchening in English, I guess, um, only on Yantif, so only on the holidays. And we don't see it at a Dachalim at all because we don't recognize that priestly class. In Israel, they duchen every Shabbat. So it's really interesting for us to, to I had never been in a community that on a weekly basis, the, the Kohen, whoever is a Kohen in the room is called forward to lift their talit, to spread their fingers in the way that the Kohanim apparently did. And we're going to see something about that in just a minute and to recite the, the priestly blessing. Um, I'm just curious. So Marcy, are you saying you just learned about this caste separation in more recent years? Yeah. And Shlomo, um, you've told me before about your experience as participating in the Duchenen. Would you share with the group about that? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh... It was the three major holidays of the year. I grew up in an Orthodox shul in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And on the three pilgrimage holidays, the Kohanim would dichen. And uh, in my family, it was my father's father, my father and my older brothers and an uncle or two. And, and uh, I remember before my bar mitzvah, really thinking about and being excited about once I was bar mitzvah, I would be able to dichen with the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a friend who was about two months older than me who was a levy. And after his bar mitzvah, the thing between us was that when I become bar mitzvah, he was going to come with me before the dichenin and he was going to wash my hands. And we all wore white socks. We didn't, we weren't barefoot. Mm -hmm. But I remember he and I were excited about the possibility that once I become bar mitzvah, when the Kohanim go up at the beginning of the, right before the Amidah starts, and go upstairs to the room where the Kohanim get ready, and he would come up there and 
tend to me as every good lady should do with their particular Kohen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the first time that I dichened, it was, was Pesach, 1953. <laughs> and the although it, you know, you lift your arms like this, you lift your arms above you, you had your talus above you, over your head. And our particular cantor, our chazan, Max Kotlowitz, he would say, Yivarechecha, and then the Kohanim would repeat Yivarechecha, and he would say all the words, and then when we came to the end, the Yishmarecha, then the Kohanim would sing the whole melody and end up with the word the Yishmarecha for the three different parts of the, of the bracha. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the talis, I mean, Try holding your arms off, like, even for four minutes. Mm -hmm. And with a talus on top, it gets heavy. And I was, I'm still a small man, but I was even a smaller 13-year-old. And my brother said to me, I want you to stand behind me. And if you need to, you can rest your, uh, your hands on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the first couple of times I had, I went up to Dichen, toward the end, I did put my hands back down on his shoulders and held them up like that. I think one of the mysteries of the thing was the members of the kahal, of the congregation, were not supposed to look at the kohanim who were doing the davening. And if they did, they might become blinded. That was one of the little things that was going on. And I remember when I went to Israel after I graduated high school and I wanted to go to the cemetery in Sanhedria, but that's when I gave up the kihuna. When I walked, on, when I walked onto that cemetery, we were visiting the, the graves of some of our Chachamim. And I understood that once I go onto that cemetery, Kohanim are not supposed to go into a graveyard. Mm -hmm. That, uh, I was given up the kahuna, hmm. and uh, I don't know. That's kind of that's kind of what it was. It was a big family thing in my family, hmm. uh, and it was an important thing. And uh, I don't know. The only other thing I can say about being a kohen is I once participated in a pigyon haben, and I got five silver dollars for it. <laughs> Which, by the way, I think is also in this parasha. When the oldest, when the Levites are used in this parasha to mm -hmm. uh, exchange in exchange for the oldest born. Mm -hmm. Great, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't think there are many of us who can share a firsthand account like that. Okay, we have a few more minutes, and I have one more thing I really would like to share with you. Except, where did it just go? Shoot, hold on just a second. Come back here. Okay, I had put some things in about explaining about Duchenin, but I think we just got an even better ex explanation than, than my, uh, my explanation. Okay. Look with me now at Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, which is going to be the inspiration for a different interpretation of the practice of Duchenin, as Shlomo has just described to us. Okay, so this is now from Shir Hashirim, chapter 2, verse 9. Dome dodili tzvi, my beloved is like a gazelle, or the ofer ha'ayalim, or like a young stag. Hine ze omed, behold, he stands there, achar kotlenu, behind our wall, mashgiach mina chalonot, uh, gazing in or peering in through the windows, metzitz min ha'charakim. Peeking in through the lattice. So some of you are familiar with the way that this verse is used to um, explain the way the, the Shirat Hayam, the verses of the Song of the Sea, are laid out in the Torah like a lattice. If you look at them in the Torah, they're like a lattice. And there's some beautiful Hasidic um, commentaries that say this, this is what it is. It's God peeking through at you as you read the Song of the Sea and experience that freedom. 
But here's another way of looking at it. So this is from Midrash Tanhuma, one of our earlier, although it's not as old as Midrash Rabbi, but we're not going to do the whole thing. Uh, but look what happens here. Okay. Um, so this is Midrash Tanhuma on our parasha, on number 6, 22 and 23, the beginning of the, the section that includes the priestly blessing. Vaidaber Adonai el Moshe lemor, God speaks to Moses saying, Daber el Aharon ve'el banav lemor, speak to Aaron and his sons and say, Ko tivarchu et b'nei Yisrael. This is how you shall bless the children of Israel. Okay, and then the Midrash goes on. You can see I put the ellipsis in here. The Midrash goes on to talk a lot about priests who are not fit for saying the priestly blessing. We're going to skip all of that down to here. Amar kadosh baruchu, mitchila ani hayiti mevarech brioti. So God says, in the beginning, I would bless the people. Mikan ve'elach hare habrachot mesorot lachem. From now on, it's on you. You all, priests, will bless the children of Israel. Therefore, Amara Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One of Blessing, says to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to take care. And you can almost hear God saying, remember Aaron, what happened to your sons when they kind of got a little too passionate or something? Nadav and Avihu, that's almost like a, in a parenthetical thing here. Shehayu mevarchin et Yisrael, be careful now about how you bless the children of Israel. Ko tivarchu, this is how you shall bless them. Zesha amara katuv, hashkifa mimaon kod shecha, look down. Look out from your holy abode, min hashamayim, from the heavens, uvarech et amcha. So here he's quoting from, the Midrash is quoting from Deuteronomy. Look down from your heavenly dwelling place and bless your people. Amra knesset Yisrael lifnei kadosh baruch the The entire community of Israel, it's a beautiful image, knesset Yisrael lifnei kadosh baruch Hu, before the Holy One of Blessing says, Ribono shel olam, master of the world, la kohanim ata omer sheyivarchu otanu. We only need you to tell the kohanim to bless us. Where am I now? En anu trichin ela levirchatcha. We don't need, here I'm going to switch over to the English just to get us through this a little quicker here. We only need you to bless us. Look down from your heavenly, tell, tell them, look down from your heavenly abode and bless us. And the God answers them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, although I have told the priests to bless you, I am standing along with them and blessing you. Lefichach, for that reason, HaKohanim Porshin et Kapehem. And that's why they spread their fingers Lomar Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, Omed Acharenu. So, uh, for that reason, the priests spread their hands. They do so to say, as if the priests are saying, we're spreading our hands so that the Holy One of Blessing, who is standing behind us, that face, that energy, that gaze can be seen through our fingers. So it is in allusion to Shir Hashirim that we just read. omed achar kotlenu. Here he is standing behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice between the fingers of the priests, peering through the lattice when they extend their hands. It is therefore stated, l'chach ne'amar kod tivarchu et b'nei Yisrael. This is how you shall bless the children of Israel with the awareness as leaders, whatever you are, Kohen, Shaliach Tzibor, whoever you are in leadership, if you're blessing the congregation, you have to know that the presence of God is standing behind you, shining through you, if you're doing it in the way that the tradition is inviting you to do.
Uh, so just pause here and so a few minutes for additional comments or thoughts. It looks like Shlomo, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm struck in the Hebrew that you just read the word upor sin et kapehen, mm -hmm. and they spread out their fingers. But I'm struck by the connection to ufros alenu sukat shlomecha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how that word brings peace because of, you know, I, I like that connection very much. Yeah, beautiful. So just so people hear it, ufros alenu spread over us your shelter of peace, your sukkah. Yeah, beautiful. Just see. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead, Marsha or Kevin. One quick comment and a question. Um, I remember the Duchenin the way Shalomo did, except I was in the congregation as a Yisraelim. And my grandfather would be next to me, and he would push my head down and keep it down during the Duchenin so that I wouldn't go blind. Mm -hmm. So I exactly remember that. Yeah. Um, then my question is, where does Anna the Koach come in in the name of God? Mm. Uh, it's a good question, and it's a fitting one for this week since Shavuot is coming up, and that's one of the things that we say, especially on Shavuot. You know, I think that Anna Bakoach has a relationship now that you ask, I have to go back and check myself, but I believe it has a relationship with this question of the 42 letter name of God. So if we're searching for an example of what that might be, it could be in Anna Bakoach. So Kevin, thank you for asking that. Um, it's good to go and find out. I will have to look and find out. Um, I have one last thing I want to show you before we close up. So Steve, go ahead and then I'll go to this. Where are you, Steve? Steve, don't forget to unmute. You're muted right now. Yeah, I, I wanted you to make your point before I guess that this was a sort of a PS on the conversation rather than significant. So please go um, ahead. Okay, just one last thing. So Kevin just mentioned, um, Kevin just mentioned this, um, I hope I'm not insulting anyone by saying this superstition that if you look at the priests when, if you, excuse me, if you look at the Kohen while they're Duchenin, you could go blind. And, um, you know, I'm certainly no authority on Duchenin, uh, but I think the most communities, including the most observant communities, no longer teach their their members to think in that way. But it's interesting to hear that even as recently as, as Kevin, as your childhood, that still was a, a custom, at least, that people followed. Um, so you're supposed to lower your eyes while the, the Duchenin was going on. By the same token, um, there's, a, there's a, an instruction that when the Duchenin is going on, the Duchenin is going on. When the Duchenin is going on, um, the community and the and the Kohanim who are reciting the the priestly blessing remember that the new no, the the Kohanim recite the verse and the community responds Ken Yehiratzon, and or actually in Israel they just said Amen. They didn't say Ken Yehiratzon. I don't know why that custom was a little different, but that you're not supposed you have to wait until each one finishes. The Kohanim are not supposed to proceed until they hear the communal response, and the community is not supposed to, you know, interrupt the Kohanim. But all of it has to be heard clearly, is my point. So even if you weren't supposed to look, you're definitely supposed to hear and respond. So I just wanted to share one last thing with you that I found fascinating myself. And this is just from, um, in my searching around about this topic, this last little piece about dreams. Uh, so this is from an Orthodox teacher, and he's, he's suggesting to us that there's a relationship between our desire to understand our dreams and the sort of the medicine of the priestly blessing. So we see here, uh, one teaching is a person who's had a dream that requires interpretation, but, uh, but does know 
I think he means, but does not know whether that dream bodes well, should recite a prayer at the time of the Duchenin. So while the Duchenin is going on, this is, he's quoting the, um, the Talmud here, Brachot 55, and also the Shulchan Aruch, which is our, one of our central law codes. Um, so the text, just look at this, the text of the prayer that you can say if you've had a dream that's bothering you, you've had a dream and you're thinking, what does this dream mean? Wait for the next Duchenin. <laughs> And when that's going on, you can say this. Ribono shalolam, I am yours and my dreams are yours. I dreamed a dream that I do not know what it is, whether it is something I have dreamt about myself or it is something that my friends dreamt about me or whether it is something that I dreamt about them. If these dreams are indeed good, strengthening them like the dreams, strengthen them like the dreams of Yosef, of Joseph. However, if the dreams need to be healed, Heal them like Moshe healed the bitter waters of Mara, and as Miriam was healed from her tsara'at, and as Chizkiyahu was healed from his illness, and as the waters on Yericho were healed by Elisha. Just as you change the curse of Bilam to a blessing in Parashat Balak, so change all my dreams for goodness. So when he says here, according to the Vilna Gaon, the prayer should be recited at the end of all three blessings, all three lines of the priestly blessing, then just at the Yahi Ratzon. Uh, and this teacher helpfully goes on to say, if you're living in Chutz La'aretz, outside of the land of Israel, and the only duchen three times a year, you can find other ways to say this prayer, because you may not remember that you had a dream if you have to wait all the way until Sukkot or something. Uh, so thank you for the chance to explore a little bit with you today about Birkat Kohanim, about the history of it, about the, uh, the spiritual practices that are inherent in it. And so before we say final goodbye, Steve, do you want to jump in here? So I, I thought it might, uh, uh, it, it, whenever I think of names of God the, and this topic comes up, I think of a very powerful planetarium experience I had, which uh, enacted a short story, and I don't know which famous science fiction author, Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke, whatever, but it was called like the 21 million names of God or something like that. Mm. And uh, there was this reporter who was going to visit this ancient monastery in India or wherever, where the the monks were given the, the job over the centuries to catalog all the names of God. And they had been doing this for centuries, passing it down. And the reporter was going there because they were getting close to the end. And mm -hmm. um, you know, there was all this theological and philosophical discussion. What would happen when they finished their job in cataloging all the names of God? And, mm -hmm. The bottom line is, so, so the thing is playing out in this planetarium, if you can imagine that setting. And uh, as they reach the last name, the stars start to blink out. Mm. And when all the stars in the entire planetarium, I mean, you can imagine it going completely dark, then there is this, in the speaker, it says, let there be light. And wow. then there's this explosion of, you know, galaxies and stars filling the screen. I just want to share that. It's one of Thank my you. favorite short stories. Powerful image. It was um, Clark. Was it Clark? Yeah. Clark. Okay. Um, this is impromptu and informal, but here we have with us an immediate past president who is able to join us today without the burden of presidency sitting on her shoulders. So Marcy, there'll be other opportunities to thank you and Judy more formally coming up. But for now, what a, what a pleasure it is to see you in our Zoom room today and wish you many more times to participate as just a regular member and uh, enjoy. Thank so, you very much, Rachel. Absolutely. Thank you. Everybody keep well, uh, early Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach. <laughs>